Welcome to the Youth Have Power Speaker Series. We are so glad you could join us tonight. My name is Ellen and I use she, her pronouns. I'm a junior at Lake Placid High School in Northern New York. And I am tuning in to you tonight from occupied Haudenosaunee land. Tonight, we are focusing on a very important topic, justice, equity, and the climate crisis. We know that climate change and social justice are very closely linked and it, we're here to talk about what that looks like and why it matters to everyone. I am part of a team of students that is planning Youth Have Power and I'm here to get us started. You might have heard that Youth Have Power is a virtual adaptation of the Adirondack Youth Climate Summit, which would have been in its 12th year this November held at the Wild Center in Northern New York. Since we can't be in person this year, I'm excited to welcome you all to this virtual space. My name is Astrid and I use she, her pronouns. I'm also a junior at the Lake Placid High School. The Youth Climate Program is based out of the Wild Center, a new kind of science museum in the Adirondack Park in Northern New York. Check out our website to learn more about the Wild Center and learn about some otters that were just released to the wild. You're here because you registered for Youth Have Power. Youth Have Power is about learning how to take climate action with others, feeling connected to a larger community, and creating a space to talk about what's happening. Here's a recap of some Youth Have Power events over the past few weeks and a heads up for what's to come. Shout out to everyone who has joined some fantastic Unwind Climate Time events. We've all had a great time meeting other climate leaders at Climate Trivia while decompressing and doodling after a stressful couple of weeks. I highly suggest Unwind Climate Time. It's a really good time where you can just relieve some stress and let out anything that's been bothering you. You can still register for Youth of Power so you can join us at upcoming events like the Speaker Reflection Youth Meetup. Reflect and discuss what you learned with other youth climate leaders. Also, come to a special holiday edition of Unwind Climate Time on November 24th to get some plant-based recipe inspiration for the upcoming holidays. I'll be there with some great plant-based recipes and I hope to see you guys there to do some fun holiday crafts as well. Last, for a grand finale, come get excited about the final climate action event on December. We know that climate, we know that planning is near impossible this year. So we've taken some of the guesswork out of climate action planning for you. Pick one of these product project categories to work through at your own pace. All projects can be completed while at home and socially distanced, so no worries if you aren't at school in person. You'll also get connected to other youth leaders that are interested in your same pathway, so you have some folks to hold you accountable. Now, we're going to switch gears and get ready to hear from our guest speakers. Before we turn it over to them, we're going to review a few terms that you will hear them reference in their presentations. First, BIPOC. This acronym stands for Black, Indigenous, and People of Color, and it emphasizes that people of color have very different experiences of injustice. Next, marginalized communities. These are groups that experience exclusion and discrimination due to unequal power relationships. Frequently, marginalized communities may be BIPOC or, or low-income or rural or immigrant communities. Next, environmental justice. This term refers to the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin, or income with respect to environmental regulations or policies. Another way to think about environmental justice is prioritizing local communities' input into environmental decisions happening where they live. Next, environmental health. This is a branch of public health that focuses on connections between environmental quality, human health, and disease. Frequently, marginalized communities live in places with low environmental quality, and as a consequence, may suffer health, pro health problems from air and water pollution. These are environmental health issues. Last, but certainly not least, environmental racism. 
This, uh, this means racial discrimination in making environmental policies, enforcing laws, targeting marginalized communities, or polluting industries, and excluding BIPOC leaders from environmental leadership positions. Generally, environmental racism describes how BIPOC communities bear the brunt of climate change and environmental impacts. I hope that this helps give you a foundation in what you're about to hear from our speakers. Please feel free to ask questions in the comments and we will have our speakers answer them after the presentation. It is finally time to turn it over to our speakers. First, we're going to hear from Taylor Morton, uh, the Environmental Health and Education Manager for We Act for Environmental Justice based in Harlem, New York. Their work has included co-facilitating and creating curricula for the organization's educational programs. Taylor also recognizes the importance of exposing minority, urban, and low-income youth to nature. We also have Kevin Patel, and he is the co-founder and executive director of One Up Action International, based in Los Angeles, an organization that supports and empowers marginalized youth by providing them with the resources they need to be change makers. Through his work with One Up Action, Patel collaborated with the community to create the first of its kind Youth Climate Commission in LA County to amplify youth voices on the climate crisis. Lastly, Sydney Asher. She is a junior at Margaretville High School in the Catskill region of New York State. She studied the disproportionate impacts that climate change hazards bring to socioeconomically disadvantaged people for a year while she was involved in the University of Albany's School Science Research Program. Sydney is co-president of her school's Climate Science Club and is a student organizer for the annual Catskills Youth Climate Summit. Now, I'm excited to turn it over to Taylor. I'm on mute. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, give me one second to put my presentation. Here we go. One more second. There we go. All right. Uh, so thanks so much for having me. Uh, my name is Taylor Wharton. I'm with We Act for Environmental Justice uh, as the Environmental Health and Education Manager. Uh, and to talk a little bit more about uh, who We Act is and, and what we do. Uh, we Act has been around for 30 years, give or take. Um, and our focus is in Northern Manhattan. And we focus on Northern Manhattan. We've, we've started on focus on Northern Manhattan initially. Um, really understanding that there were and still are a lot of environmental hazards that um, have impacted the health of, of the residents who live uh, uptown, right? Uh, historically, we've seen that as uh, there are a lot of bus depots uh, in northern Manhattan. There are uh, a lot more marine transfer stations and highways and other sort of uh, infrastructure that, that impact uh, the, the environment that folks live in. Um, and understanding that uh, that is intentional, right? Uh, and that uh, our environment is built around uh, a lot of different things. and and. Uh, both natural environment, urban environment, sort of whatever you want to call it, uh, and really understanding that uh, race, um, race, income, wealth, uh, all of these other sort of pieces play a role in, in uh, all of these factors that impact our environment and in turn impact our health. Uh, so we started working on Northern Manhattan, and, and since then we've grown to uh, work on issues at the city, state, and uh, and federal levels as well. We also have a DC office. Um, and we focus on uh, sort of three main areas, one around uh, environmental health and research, another on community organizing and, and the other on policy. Uh, and these three pieces sort of uh, interact with each other uh, and allow us to get really involved in uh, creating positive changes, not only for communities like uh, those in northern Manhattan, but others across the nation who uh, either work in, in solidarity with us or uh, have a lot of the same issues that, that, that we have going on. 
uh, to talk a little bit more about our focus areas and what we uh, what we do, we focus on a lot of different topics um, and understanding that environmental justice, uh, a lot of times we say environmental justice and we sort of mean a, a broad umbrella of things, but uh, in all truth and honesty, and environmental justice spans to so many different topics. Uh, almost everything that we think about uh, when we consider environment touches on some aspect of uh, environmental justice or environmental health. So these are our 10 sort of focus areas and we have a couple of others that, that aren't mentioned uh, here. Uh, and our focus areas are really led by our members. So the people who uh, live in Northern Manhattan who are really impacted by these issues, uh, who are really the first to say, hey, uh, we're having, you know, these sort of problems, uh, what are some things that we can do to, uh, to change this situation? Uh, and when we say change the situation, uh, when we really think about environmental justice, it really hinges on that meaningful involvement and fair treatment uh, and understanding that those two things are very different, uh, but something that we strive for in, in all of these areas. Um, I work in education and environmental health, so I, I do a little bit of work on some of these topics um, as it relates to environmental health um, and then all of these topics across uh, education. Um, also understanding that um, a lot of the education around these topics doesn't happen in school, so we do a lot of adult education as well. Uh, and understanding that the learning doesn't stop, that a lot of times uh, the education that or knowledge and skills that you need around solving problems around environmental justice and climate justice are often learned uh, outside of the traditional uh, traditional classrooms. Um, just to give a little bit more background on environmental justice and what I do, uh, I think it's really important to understand uh, the beginning of, uh, of environmental justice uh, and understanding that there's been a lot of indigenous work happening for, for uh, you know, a lot longer time uh, that the in the 60s, uh, the civil rights movement, as well as other movements uh, uh, around farmers rights, workers rights, uh, the labor movement, uh, and a lot of other movements sort of uh, began to coalesce into what we see as the more modern day environmental justice movement. Uh, even when we think about Dr. King, and in uh, as a question for you, I, I always ask folks, does anybody know what happened to Dr. King uh, in April in Memphis, Tennessee? You can write in the chat. If there's not a chat option, I'll keep going. All right, I'm going to keep going. So in Memphis, Tennessee, in April, Dr. King was assassinated uh, at the Lorraine Motel. Uh, that's a, a key bit of, of Black history for you all. Um, but all of that to say, um, the movement that Dr. King was working around at the time was sanitation. And sanitation is a really big key around uh, the environmental justice movement. It's a lot of what we see in the South. Um, a lot of what we see, uh, not so much in New York City, because uh, there's not the land for it, but it's a lot of the roots of, of the movement, even thinking about in uh, Warren County, North Carolina, and in parts of Texas as well. This was a really big piece of environmental justice. And there are a lot of communities uh, that were having landfills put right next to them. And uh, as we've seen, uh, especially in the past, uh, in the past 10 to 20 years, that a lot of folks have been having adverse health effects from, from living that close to, uh, to a landfill. So not only understanding those health impacts, but understanding some sort of those uh, structural pieces as to why the landfills are put in certain places. Why are highways, highways built in certain places? Um, and what are the health impacts that, that we notice and acknowledge? Uh, and all of that saying, there's also this burden of proof, uh, which is something that we, we work on at, at We Act as well. So really understanding that um, even if a lot of times folks in community are saying, hey, this is a problem for us, this is something that we're seeing it impacting our health, uh, a lot of times court systems, any other type of, of governing systems will, uh, will ask that the, these groups 
prove that they are having this impact. So not only are you dealing with the impacts in your everyday life, but you are um, dealing with the burden of proof and having to sort of shoulder that burden. Um, there are a lot of different environmental justice events, as, as mentioned before, all of the topics that we've covered have some sort of branch off of, of, a, of an environmental justice uh, event. Uh, and understanding that they, they all aren't, um, they're often seen as events, but often have really deep roots uh, in, in the way that, um, the way that resources and, and other assets that contribute to our livelihood are, are structured. Um, just to name a few, we, we, I know we've heard about uh, Standing Rock, we've heard about Flint, Michigan. There's also uh, a lot of uh, lead and water quality issues in Newark, New Jersey. Um, areas like Louisiana as well, are, who are also dealing with both climate justice and environmental justice issues. When we think about infrastructure, access to resources, uh, and uh, resiliency as a right. Uh, and that if there is some type of, of uh, climate event or natural disaster or anything like that, that you have the right to survive. You have the right to have the resources that you need to, uh, to make it through and thrive and all of those pieces. And if you look here, there's a, a poster from one of our earlier campaigns that says, if you live uptown, breathe at your own, your own risk, which referred to uh, at the time, the majority of the bus depots in Manhattan were located above 96th Street, so uptown, uh, which means that a lot of folks were seeing uh, higher rates of asthma in adults, in children, and higher, uh, you know, visits to the, the hospital and all these sorts of things that, um, that impacted folks uptown. Um, and, and we've been able to see a little bit of shifting on that, but that was one of our, our bigger campaigns to uh, just to get the, the city to switch to a different sort of uh, fuel, fuel source for, for buses. Uh, but those are just some examples of, of where we sort of fit in the narrative around environmental justice. Um, the environmental justice is, uh, events and, and issues in New York state also extend, uh, you know, extend to a, a large spectrum of, of problems, right? Um, and so in some areas, you may see more issues around water quality, other areas more around um, energy efficiency and, and all those sorts of things. So uh, there's more than enough to go around and on a lot of different issues and, and topics to cover. Um, talked about this before a little bit. We work on organizing research and advocacy. Uh, we do some education and training as well. We have a program called the EHJLT, uh, which is sort of my, uh, my baby. Um, but the EHJLT is a training program that's been around for the past 20 years uh, and, and has uh, offered both youth and adults a chance to uh, sort of sharpen those skills around uh, environmental health and environmental justice as it relates to doing the actual work in your community. Uh, we have a, a group of 800 or so WEAC members that we meet with once every second Saturday of the month. Um, and we in, engage in a lot of research as well. Uh, and, and also engage in advocacy. So really making sure that uh, we're doing the research, we're doing the education and the organizing, but when it comes to making the change, uh, how do we do that through policy? I wanted to talk a little bit about the social determinants of health and get into uh, some of those pieces. So I don't know if you've heard of social determinants of health before, um, but the social determinants of health really help us uh, sort of understand um, life expectancy. It helps us understand what are all the things that contribute to how we live, how long we're able to live, what quality of life we're, we're able to live. Um, and it's a really big key to finding solutions that work. Uh, and finding solutions that will show the desired result. And the desired result is that um, quality of life is extended and that you have the right to the same length and quality of life as, as folks who have you know, access to everything that they need in their communities. Um, and that can include a lot of different things. These are only a few. So your economic st uh, stability, social neighborhood context, um, health in general, education can also include things like race and, and all of these other, uh, all these other sort of topics. Uh, and I, a really big part of this and the way that this connects to environmental justice is understanding that 
uh, we have these different social determinants of health. Um, and maybe there are things here that we, we can't see. Um, there are things here that uh, some groups may have a different approach or perspective on and uh, really wanting to make sure that any type of solution or program or anything that's been implemented really takes a good look at all of these social determinants of health. Um, and thinking about life expectancy, you can definitely tell your uh, life expectancy by your zip code. Uh, and that's a, a really big key to this as well. Understanding that there are so many environmental justice uh, communities. There are a lot of communities that have lower zip codes because of access to healthcare, access to clean food and, and healthy food and, and all of these sorts of things. If you live next to uh, a, a landfill, right, that's going to impact your, your life expectancy. Um, and we do work on the local, state, and federal levels, and there are definitely environmental justice communities on, on all of those levels. Um, and sort of what, what we see in the media is, is uh, when folks sort of speak out on these issues, uh, sort of those sort of cases get highlighted, but uh, there are many, many more uh, sort of environmental justice and climate justice cases that, uh, that are on the, the caseload of, of things that we should be looking at. Um, as far as New York City goes, uh, New York City is no different. Uh, and in fact, the city releases data that tells you uh, what life expectancy is in your, your community district, right? Uh, and if you are outside of New York City, I'm pretty sure that there's some type of thing like this for you in your city. There's definitely a state model, um, but all this information is, uh, is pretty much up for grabs. So um, what we've seen here and what we are able to see in a lot of our work and what we do in our, our work is focus on, uh, focus on neighborhoods that have historically been overlooked, under-resourced, undervalued, all of these things. Uh, so. A lot of times we'll see in the Bronx and in northern Manhattan, here we are in parts of Staten Island, parts of Queens in Brooklyn. Uh, we'll see a lot of the trends carry. When we look at heat stress and vulnerability, we had a really big campaign this summer on heat stress and vulnerability. Um, understanding that uh, cooling centers, so I don't know if anyone's ever been to a cooling center. A cooling center is a, a public place that offers free air conditioning, basically. Uh, and, and a person to monitor, you know, folks coming in and out. Um, if the cooling centers are shut down for COVID and temperatures are reaching 101 degrees outside and understanding we live in a, in New York, we live in this sort of big concrete slab. And if you don't own an air condition, it's gonna be really hot in there and you're, you're probably gonna be vulnerable to heat stroke. Uh, so understanding that the areas here that we've sort of highlighted before that have the lower life expectancies um, are going to be the same areas that are impacted by all of these issues stacked one on top of each other. We look at asthma emergency visits. We talked about if you live uptown, breathe at your own risk, right? About the majority of the bus depots living, uh, existing uptown, that uh, the number of asthma visits are going to be higher, uh, especially in, in kids when we look at long term. Um, when we look at the long-term effects of it, um, understanding uh, the trends of, of COVID, right? And uh, when we think about what it means to be black and brown and have pre-existing conditions, what it means to be black and brown and lower income and have pre-existing conditions and uh, you know, putting aside costs of, of healthcare and all those other things, right? That uh, those pre-existing conditions are caused by a lot of these environmental justice issues are caused by this uh, this intentional change in infrastructure and, and distribution of, of resources. Uh, and what we see here as well when we look at um, lead. Uh, so homes that have peeling paint uh, and homes that have lead that um, all of these issues sort of stack on top of each other. And uh, my colleagues and I, we work on all of these issues at one time. We work on a spectrum of issues because uh, you know it's not as if you know we say well we're focusing on lead this time that the mold issues won't continue to come that the issues around uh, extreme heat and all of these other sorts of things will continue to come so those are just some things to um, that those are things to to keep in mind and think about um, I think I have five more minutes so I'm gonna keep going. Uh, and then if there's time left, if I run out of slides, then I can come back to it.
But I was asked to talk a little bit about how we can transform our communities to be better. Um, as mentioned before, mentioned a couple of times, we do work on uh, a lot of different levels, mostly on the local and the national levels, national meaning state and federal levels. We do a little bit of work on the global lo level, but, um, but not as much. You can definitely set your sights on activism and uh, in your own way, in, in this sort of way, if you want to. Uh, it's definitely suggested to start on the local level and that uh, every local place has its own special historical context and intersection around environmental justice. So uh, that may be something to think about and, uh, and consider depending on wherever you live. Um, direct service, if there's a way to directly get involved to volunteer, to offer service, we do a lot of trainings, that's a direct service. We train folks around just transition. If you're gonna have solar panels, that's great. Um, but if the person who's working on uh, whatever existed before solar panels can't adapt, then they're gonna be out of a job. And that, that economic piece is absolutely crucial too. Uh, our neighborhoods and understanding that that uh, that's a piece of our, our livelihood and that it's in the best interest if we make sure that folks are trained to to have what they need. Um, we do a lot of just transition training. We do some other direct service. We do a lot of education as well. I mentioned the HLT um, as one of my my favorite programs. Uh, education absolutely can can be a way to get involved and transform your communities. Uh, I think also viewing education as a form of action and not a form as a of uh, sort of passive um, passive engagement is really important. And that education is often coupled with some sort of, of action to make sure that uh, folks can apply the skills and knowledge that have been used. Um, Speaking uh, for and with others, this is a big piece about working with your elected officials, uh, making sure that uh, everyone understands that they work for you. Um, they do represent you. You can easily vote them out. I think we've, we've seen them, we've seen this a lot, uh, especially on the, um, the state and local level sort of elections, right? When there's a big change or something happens in community uh, that folks don't like, right? They tend to get uh, tend to get voted out, but uh, knowing that your voice is important and understanding how to organize um, and understanding that you can do that with a group or a nonprofit, but you can also do that um, in your own group of friends. You can do that as a group of students, but this is a really important piece. Um, there's also like a, a sort of a treading, uh, treading light of the speaking for others and understanding that um, communities have their own voices and, and have their own needs that they can only uh, articulate and speak for themselves. So uh, at some point, it's a lot of uplifting voices uh, of people who are often uh, shaded or, you know, not seen by, uh, by folks with power. So that's another level to this, but definitely our elected officials play a, a very strong role in this work. Um, and I think that's about it. Um, the only thing else I would say, I've been working at WEAC since I was an intern. So I worked my way up uh, through the chain, uh, sort of left and came back. I've been an intern, a fellow, a consultant, uh, and now I work full time. Um, so uh, sticking with it is really important and a really important part of it for me. Uh, and as someone who was born and raised in the South and now uh, fights on environmental justice issues up north, uh, having a good bird's eye view of uh, the commitment for uh, others in the community who look like me, even if they don't, you know, we don't have this sort of the same um, background of growing up has been really important to me in this work. Um, and maybe a key part for you all as you uh, work towards um, becoming stronger and better uh, advocates and activists in your communities. And I think that is 6.59. And I'm going to turn it over to Kevin, I think. Thank you so much, uh, Taylor. And I'm going to share my screen. So give me a moment to apologize.
Perfect. Amazing. How is everyone today? Well, tonight uh, evening, I'm in. I'm joining you from Los Angeles, so it's still um, it's still the afternoon here. Um, Taylor put it very, very, you know, well. And environmental justice is not just about um, equity or equality, right? It's about justice. It's about making sure that everyone has the equal tools and opportunities to fight for their communities. Um, the president, the presentation that I'm about to give is about uh, youth activism in, in, in its all in in all its facets. Um, I'm really talking about my journey in youth activism when I first started nine years ago. Um, and so uh, the presentation, I, I named it uh, almost a decade because I've been an activist, a youth climate activist for almost a decade. Um, as you know, we also have a decade, almost a decade left to really act on the climate crisis. So it fits hand to hand. You know, I've been fighting for almost a decade, but I also, we also have, you know, a decade left. Um, but beginning with my personal story and how I really became active in environmentalism and climate activism, um, it started nine years ago when I was uh, at the age of 11, when I was affected, directly affected by the air and smog pollution. But even before then, I was actively, you know, fighting and advocating for my community. And what I was doing was I was, you know, awoken and I was seeing the inequalities and injustices that were happening to my community of South Central Los Angeles. Um, you know, one of the biggest problems that uh, is, you know, present within South Central Los Angeles is how we are in a food desert. Um, a lot of my peers at that time, uh, you know, is middle school. <laughs> so I'm sure a lot of you guys are well familiar with that, but you know, it was during the time I was in middle school and a lot of my peers didn't know, you know, where food came from or where food grows. You know, a lot of them died coming from the grocery store or the fast food restaurants that were a block or two away. And so a lot of, a lot of that was just sad to see that, you know, that a lot of my, a lot of my peers didn't know where food came from and where, you know, that they can grow their own food. Um, and you know, how South Central Los Angeles is a food desert or uh, AKA a food prison, you know, a, a term that's coined by Ron Finley, uh, who is amazing, who does a lot of, you know, a lot about growing gardens within South Central Los Angeles. Uh, but that's where my journey really began until second semester of my sixth grade year when I was directly impacted by the air and smog pollution and, you know, was in and out of the hospital because of that. Um, and ever since then, you know, three three years went past, you know went by, and I, I noticed that it's not just me that was being affected. It was my community, the place that I love, the people that I love, um, and you know, the place that I grew up in. Um, and I wasn't just seeing how air and smog pollution, nor the food inequalities. I was seeing all these injustices and inequalities that was happening to my community. And I really wanted to do something about it to give you know, give back to my community, not only to advocate, you know, if I'm not advocating who is, right? Um, there's many different facets of activism, as Taylor mentioned, you know, you can start at the local level, the national level, or you could even go into the global level and work with NGOs and nonprofits and such. Um, and I really much in my earlier years of activism, I began with uh, the local level, starting at the grassroots and making sure that my community is able to advocate be on behalf of themselves. Um, because, you know, no one was really noticing these inequalities and injustices and I really wanted to do something about it. And then I moved on to national and I really wanted to do something in the field of, you know, getting young people more BIPOC, as you know, uh, during the, be in, in the very beginning, you guys learned the term BIPOC or Black Indigenous uh, People of Color. And, you know, these are the communities that are at the forefront and at the front lines of the climate crisis. Um, and I really wanted to make sure that, you know, young people who look like me can go into uh, government and really not only have their voices represented and have them amplified, but making sure that they have a seat at the table, that they're able to, you know, not only have a voice and be amplified, but make those key decisions on behalf of their communities. Um, and I'll go into that a little bit later. Um, and then I also now work globally with uh, a nonprofit that I started last year during the UN week. Uh, and I also will go into that a little bit later, but I'm gonna be talking about youth activism and in, in, in it's all, it's facet and also 
talking about my personal story of being an activist for almost a decade and uh, talking about the future of activism because we only have a decade to reverse the effects of the climate crisis. No, the world is not ending, but we are literally um, going to a point where we're not gonna be able to reverse the effects that we're having on the planet. So I am gonna switch my slide. Just give me a second, y'all. Um, as I said, I started nine years ago and youth activism. These are a couple photos of, uh, of me protesting and some of the protests that have happened uh, in Los Angeles really demand, um, you know, our leadership, our government officials, especially our governor, Gavin Newsom, who, you know, loves to say that he is a leader in, you know, in, um, in climate change and climate legislation and in climate policy, but he really isn't because he's permitting new fossil fuel wells and, um, you know, he's um, releasing all these permits even during the pandemic uh, to let the fossil fuel industry mine and drill within marginalized communities, low income communities. Um, and, you know, again, to give a little background of where these drills are and where the fossil fuel industry is, it's right in marginalized communities, it's in BIPOC communities, it is in low income communities. And a lot of these communities are being affected with underlying health issues, such as heart palpitation, such as irregular heartbeat, such as cancer and asthma and all of that, because it's causing all of these inequalities and just injustices that are happening to these communities. And these communities are not really able to fight back because they don't have the tools or resources to fight against a big corporation that has over millions and millions of dollars. So definitely, um, you know, um, there have been a lot of victories with the activism that has been going on, but there are a lot of, um, you know, hurdles and obstacles that, you, you know, young people, even activists here in Los Angeles face to fight these corporations. Um, but yeah, and so my journey, as I said, really began with food injustice, but really transitioned to working on the local level in Los Angeles to fight and combat the inequalities and injustices that are happening to not only my community of South Central Los Angeles, but communities, neighboring communities uh, in Los Angeles. And then, you know, ever since then, uh, you know, my activism kind of took a national, um, in a national level, and I started really getting involved um, with, you know, a lot of um, youth climate groups and also getting involved with uh, many other people to really solve the climate crisis and implementing policies and motions and working with uh, local officials and activists to really demand of our politicians to implement policies that are gonna make a difference to our communities. Uh, there are a lot of notable people that you guys are gonna see on these pictures, especially the one in, uh, in the middle with Greta who came to visit in Los Angeles. We had to plan her strike two weeks in advance. So it was kind of a stressful strike and all the other organizers are in this picture, which is amazing. Um, and some other notable figures like Billie Eilish who came to our strike uh, Bonnie Wright, who played Jeannie Weasley on um, the Harry Potter series, and then even Jaden Smith, uh, who, you know, came out to support and continues to come out and support. Um, and it, it's just amazing that you know, even celebrities and people who are, you know, affluent and who are, you know, doing this work behind the scenes are coming out and supporting our communities and, you know, just amplifying the message of climate justice. And it's so, so important to make sure that um, you know, they continue doing that. But this really has, this past five, six years has really shown me how the youth climate movement has been really changing. Because when I first got involved, it was pretty much white dominated and white, white people and white, white, white passing people have really had a space within this movement. Um, and it was, the conversations were around, you know, national parks and conservation, but it's really transitioned into, you know, making sure that we're fighting for um, BIPOC, marginalized and low-income communities, so which is pretty cool. And there's still a lot more work to be done. Um, and I just wanna talk about this strike that we had with Greta, which is, uh, again, it was going against a, a Governor Newsom, who's California's governor. I know a lot of you guys are not familiar with Governor Newsom, but I'll give you a little background story of what he's been doing. He's been uh, permitting uh, new, fossil fuel permits so that the fossil fuel industry can go into our communities and really harm um, and you know continue drilling and release these toxins and chemicals within our communities. And so a lot of the young people here have organized 
and said, it's your last chance to choose our future or fossil fuels. Um, and exactly, you know, we held this strike with Greta and we got some pushback, but we also got some uh, strides in, in doing that. Um, and again, it was our future of fossil fuels. And Greta was speaking, a good friend of mine, Nayeli Cabo, who was just recently diagnosed with cancer because she's been fighting also uh, almost for a decade and also is a huge inspiration of mine. Um, you know, she's been fighting against the fossil fuel in industry because she lived close to a drilling site. Um, but this, this whole campaign stemmed from the California Youth versus Big Oil or Stan LA, who, which is an organization that comprises of 750 environmental justice organizations. They're not just local to Los Angeles, but international, right? This is not just a Los Angeles or California issue. The fossil fuel industry is literally all around the world and throughout the globe, even in your own communities, if you look it up, uh, fossil fuels are used throughout this uh, nation and throughout the world. And so uh, San LA partners up with, you know, local, national, even global organizations to work to uh, divest from the fossil fuel industry and making sure that we're protecting marginalized BIPOC and low income communities from the devastating impacts of the climate crisis. And I don't want to take too much time because I know I don't have that much time left, but uh, go check out California Youth versus Big Oil because their mission is so, so important to making sure that we are fighting against the fossil fuel industry, um, not, not just here in California, but again, throughout the nation and throughout the world. And then I wanna transition into what the future of activism really needs to look like. Because I've talked about my past and how the movement really, environmental movement has really been white and white passing and so, one of the things that I tend to focus on with organization that I started last year um, is, you know, making sure that we're amplifying BIPOC voices, which is Black Indigenous voices, and not just amplifying, but getting, giving them a seat at the table to make, you know, uh, the key decisions on behalf of their communities, uh, because we are right now at the forefront and at the front lines of this crisis. And so, um, you know, last year, it was a momentous occasion of not only starting one of action, but uh, also getting to pass the first ever in the nation and first ever in the world Youth Climate Commission. It's never been done before. Um, and that is one of the missions of One Up Action as well as starting Youth Climate Commissions, not only throughout the United States, but you know throughout the world. Um, but going into intersectional environmentalism, what the environmental movement needs and the climate movement needs in general is how can we be intersectional as activists. And Leah Thomas recently, um, just a few months ago, came up with the term intersection environmentalism. Intersectionality is coined by Kimberly Crenshaw. I highly suggest you guys look it up. But uh, intersection environmentalism is an inclusive version of inter environmentalism that advocates for both the protection of the people and the planet. It identifies the ways in which injustices are happening to marginalized communities and the earth and how they're interconnected. And, and it brings uh, injustices done to the most vulnerable communities and the earth to the forefront and does not minimize or silence um, social inequality. Again, environmental justice is not just about equity or equality, it's about having justice for all people. And uh, like Taylor put it very well together in her presentation. So intersectional environmentalism advocates for both the people and the planet. But I like to take a spin on it and really letting you know that intersectional environmentalism is showing you how the, you know, the issues that we're advocating for, right? It's not just how we're fighting for climate change, it's how all these issues are interconnected, like the Black Lives Matter movement, the gender inequality, the Me Too movement, all these movements that are arising are all interconnected uh, with the climate crisis. They're all perpetrated by the same systems that is perpetrating the climate crisis. So. And those systems are called the systems of oppression, racism, patriarchy, uh, discrimination, and taking a look at those systems and how they're interconnected uh, will have you understand that we must first defeat and get rid of the systems of actually, you know, completely get rid of the systems that are perpetrating the oppressions and injustices and inequalities that are happening to these communities, uh, and so that we're so that we may have true justice. Um, but that is exactly what intersectional environmentalism is. And that is what 
you know, I plead and what I advocate on and I always speak about to everyone uh, because it's such an important topic. So hopefully you guys take um, this term and, you know, put it in your own context and take it and say, oh, well, it's not just for the people on the plat, but looking at how these different movements are interconnected and um, keeping this term close to your heart and even searching up Leah Thomas or Kimberly Crenshaw. And so with that being said, I think my presentation is done and I thank you for having me here. And I look forward to talking to the small group of students later on. All right, so um, I'm going to um, present my presentation in just a moment. If you'll um, just give me a second to share my screen, we can get started. Okay, so um, hello, my name is Sydney Asher and um, this is, oops, this is um, Rural Environments of Climate Justice, which um, in which I hope to provide you um, a little bit of a different perspective than what we've seen so far um, from a youth perspective, but also because um, Climate justice impacts rural communities just as much as it does urban communities. Um, and even though it may be fairly invisible um, within the climate justice activism world thus far, um, it's slowly gaining recognition. But when most people think of um, the term climate justice, they think of um, it in urban contexts. Um, but really climate justice is equally Climate justice in rural communities is equally important um, as urban climate justice for the same reasons, but in different contexts. So I have been a climate youth leader um, just about probably for the last four years with my school's climate and environmental club. And this is us shown in the picture here. Um, this was at the 2018 climate um, Youth Climate Summit, um, which we help organize in the Catskill Mountains. Um, and I help organize it with other groups from my area. Um, we, we actually just finished the last meeting, um, like last week. So I go to a school um, in a very rural area in the Catskill Mountain region of New York, um, right here. Um, and it's located in the Casco Mountain region, which is um, a state park, um, much like the Adirondacks. Um, and actually excluding the Adirondacks, the Casco Mountains are the least populated area in the United or er, in New York State. Um, so I just wanted to provide you just a few pictures of um, the Casco Mountain region. Um, we're known for our ski mountains. The ski mountains like 10 minutes away from my house. Um, we're known for lakes to fishing, mountains to hunting, land to farm, um, hiking. The Catskill Mountains are a pretty popular place um, for people to get outdoors, especially people who wouldn't have that opportunity um, other where, other, in other places um, to get outdoors. Um, we get a lot of visitors from New York City who um, travel up to enjoy the beautiful scenery and all that the Casco Mountains have to offer. Um, so I'm sure you can see the contrast between um, the beautiful mountains of the last slide and um, this picture. Um, and I think the contrast really highlights the devastation that climate events um, bring when they affect a lot of people. So this flood um, was Hurricane Irene and it hit my area in 2011. Um, and it's probably, at least in part, one of the reasons why I am involved in climate activism um, because I experienced it firsthand in my community. And although I had, I really had no idea um, what the significance of this flood was back then, I was, I was pretty young. Um, and I certainly didn't link it to climate change back then. Um, but it hit me hard and it hit my community hard. So this is a photo of Main Street, Margaretville, New York. I'm sure you can see the, the hay bales from local fields floating along the street. 
um, which I think is, it's a pretty powerful photo. Um, this is um, a photo of um, my school. And at that time, they were trying to get the buses to higher ground because um, they, they wanted the buses to um, work afterwards. Um, and then this photo is actually, um, it highlights the devastation of what happened after the flood in my community. This was our local grocery store and our local pharmacy. Um, this was also a local diner um, and it just shows the cleanup, the massive um, cleanup effort it took for the entire town to get over this flood. And actually um, this business took years to reopen afterwards um, along with uh, a lot of other businesses in my community. So um, photos like these specifically and that experience um, motivated me when I was in my school's um, science uh, research class to um, study the disproportionate impacts of climate change in rural communities of the Catskills. Um, and in my project, I, I kind of, it was like a mishmash of a mishmash of sociology, it was a mishmash of um, economics, environmental science. Um, I studied developing countries a lot um, and climate change. Um, but I, I really tried to focus on the impacts that climate change, um, specifically floods, have on rural areas. And my project really focused on the socioeconomic and um, household composition in my town of Margaretville, New York. So I basically studied how demographic, demographics like income level and age um, impact people disproportionately in a hazard. And then the, the methods and significance of becoming more resilient to these disasters in the future. Um, okay, so to kind of get started, what constitutes a rural area um, as opposed to an urban area. And this may seem like a like a simple term, but actually when you look it up, it, it's kind of confusing. Um, but rural areas um, in general are um, fairly little amounts of people on fairly large amounts of land. Um, and for the average American, the term rural is really kind of an abstract concept, especially if you live in an urban area yourself. Um, and uh, you may think of them as like rolling hills and beautiful farmland um, rather than um, like a concrete definition. Um, rural communities, especially ones who are vulnerable to climate hazards, um, are very isolated. They're um, generally low income. They have limited organization and power. Um, and they're, they're most likely, um, they most likely have kind of slow um, economic development rates. Um, so in the United States, 90% 90 per, 90 of the land mass is rural, um, but only 19.3% of the population lives on this rural land mass. So um, some of the most major climate influence catastrophes are floods, droughts, and fires. Um, they're they're the main ones that impact people in rural communities in the United States. Um, and they're increasing in severity and frequency even as we speak. I'd like to note that um, most rural climate justice issues uh, in rural communities are the result of not just individual climate events, but um, more like continuous environmental, social, and political struggles that are exacerbated by these individual events. So being socioeconomically vulnerable um, inhibits people's ability to respond, um, cope with, uh, and recover from climate hazards. Um, those who are more socioeconomically vulnerable are more likely to live in poverty. They're more likely to be employed, to have a low per capita income, to lack a high school diploma, um, and to, to live in high risk areas um, to environmental hazards that may happen. And they're also less likely to have the resources to replace damage when um, a climate hazard happens um, and less likely to have 
the insurance or the health care to ensure that they're being taken care of and that they can recover from these climate hazards. So uh, the socioeconomic status um, right here, the map that is shown, um, it, it, it's measured by the percent of people in an area that live with these conditions. Um, so those who are most affected um, are measured out of a percent closer to one, um, which is the dark green, and those who are least affected represent closer to 0%, which is represented in white. Um, so high poverty counties in the United States are persistently rural counties, and um, they're more geographically concentrated in areas um, like Appalachia, um, what's called the, the Southern Black Belt over here, um, and the Mississippi River Delta, which is down here. Um, and these areas have high levels of socioeconomic disparities. Um, furthermore, the rural poverty rate in the United States is several points higher than the urban poverty rate. Poverty rate, And both of those statistics are um, above the, the national poverty rate. And um, to add another layer of vulnerability, people of color um, are at an economic disadvantage compared to those of non-color. Um, and they're even more likely to be in poverty throughout the entire country. Um, but especially in rural areas, these inequalities are even greater than in urban ones. Um, an example of this that I found was the energy costs on reservations of um, indig indigenous people. Um, the energy costs on these reservations are 10% higher than the national average due to a lack of transmission lines to these extremely rural reservation areas. Um, and this is a common theme in uh, the climate justice movement because those who, who need help the most um, suffer the brunt of the impacts. So economic development plays a, a very important and sometimes a paradoxical role in rural communities. Um, so economic development is, it's needed for growth, um, but sometimes economic development, um, it leaves communities even worse off than they were before. Um, mainly because uh, non-local giant corporations um, exploit small towns and they can decrease um, the local investments in communities that would otherwise be better for these small towns um, when it comes to the environmental impact and also for the people who live in them. So while it's true that uh, economic project or economic development projects um, provide jobs, um, Oftentimes, these jobs are the only alternative for the people who live there, even, even if they don't want them. And especially when working in industries that damage the environment, it's just an ongoing cycle of people not having choices. Um, as a continuation and as a result of this, rural areas often lack political representation, which is, uh, as uh, Taylor and Kevin highlighted, it's a big deal in environmental justice. Um, people in rural communities sometimes have no say in the decision making that really directly impacts their lives, um, partly because they are so decentralized and so um, dispersed, but also because of bigger entities target them because they know that rural communities aren't going to be able to fight back um, as much as maybe uh, an urban community would. Um, so one example that I have of this was uh, or is um, the construction of New York City reservoirs in the Catskill Mountains. So there are um, several reservoirs in the Catskills that provide New York City with their drinking water. And while this is, a, this is an amazing project because it provides millions of people with drinking water every single day that they, that they need, um, when these reservoirs were built, it was a very controversial topic because um, the people that were displaced um, from the 10,000 acre reservoirs um, had no choice but to relocate because New York City um, bought the land and they had no choice um, but to move so these reservoirs could go in. 
So uh, natural resources and rural areas are very closely connected. Um, probably the most closely connected areas anywhere because they're, they're so close to um, ecologically vulnerable places. Um, and because they're so close and so connected to these natural resources, um, they directly impact rural communities' economic, um, social, and environmental well-being. So the entire, the entire nation benefits from these natural resources that come from rural areas. Um, but when they are harvested uh, from these rural areas, um, the rural communities pay the price. Um, one example of this is the coal, gas, and oil industry in the United States. Um, projects to remove entire mountains, like in the image on the left, um, or to frack or to um, mine minerals, they, they have possibly deadly consequences on the people who live in um, surrounding communities because um, of consequences like water tables being contaminated because of um, oil being leaked into them because of fracking or dangerous emissions that pollute the air or um, even when uh, ecosystems are completely destroyed and wildlife habitats are completely decimated. And uh, a lot of times local people have no representation and no power to control this industry from taking their land and transforming it into a wasteland. Um, one of the other major industries that uh, affects rural areas um, and the people who live in them is the agricultural industry. Um, where modern agricultural practices like monocropping or using CAFOs, which are concentrated animal feeding operations, um, compromise the environment through pollution um, with pesticides or um, excess manure that escapes into the water tables from these CAFOs, um, in addition to a lot more problems um, that really uh, can compromise the health of the people who live near them. So um, what are the solutions to this huge um, rural climate justice environmental issue? Um, how do people in rural communities adapt to these issues and make their communities more environmentally resilient? Um, so that's why this, questions like those, um, is why this movement is so important because it brings attention to the fact that if there's a decision impacting a human being in any environment um, that may harm them um, and that they live in, they should, they should be able to be a part of that process. They should have a say. So, um, and while they have a say, hopefully they can make their communities more green. Um, and in addition to fighting for access to green jobs, and um, the development of green industries. So it highlights why rural communities need to build and organize resiliency plans for the future. And in the end, it will enable vulnerable, marginalized and, under and underrepresented people um, from to build healthy, resilient and uh, really powerful communities for the future. So thank you so much. Um, I think my time is just about done. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing, but thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, it was so wonderful to speak after um, Kevin and Taylor. Um, and I am look, looking forward to what's coming next. Thank you so much, Sydney. That was fantastic. And I feel like you ended on a really um, wonderful and hopeful note for us. And um, if I could just invite the panelists to come on back on screen, um, just to answer a couple questions um, that came up throughout all of your presentations. Um, I haven't introduced myself yet. My name is Erin Griffin. I am the Youth Climate Program Manager at the Wild Center and just been here in the background, making sure all this is is happening. Um, and I just want to acknowledge before we jump into some questions that um, that we just went through a lot of information and a lot of it is is heavy and we're in a time where we're dealing with a lot of heavy stuff right now. And I even know 
a lot of the students in our audience today are dealing with you know quarantines or shifting school schedules or there's just a lot that folks are dealing with right now that's stressful and it's scary and so i just want to really thank everyone who is tuning in and i realize that every single one of you um who's listening tonight or, or tuning in at a later time that it's no small feat that you're joining us tonight and we really appreciate your commitment to learning about this um, and learning how to take action in your life so thank you everyone so much for being here um despite everything that's going on so i wanted to start out with a question um that came up kind of at the beginning and the end of the presentations tonight. So Taylor started out your presentation talking about meaningful involvement and how that is a real cornerstone issue of environmental justice. And Sydney, you ended your presentation with that too about how um, your vision for how rural communities can be more um, involved in developing these resilience plans and visions for, their, where, for where rural folks live. And so I just want to come back to this, this notion of meaningful involvement and just ask all of you for the communities that you work with and that you live in and that you identify with, like, what does that meaningful involvement look like? Like, if you could make that a little bit more specific, um, like, what, what would it really look like for you if your community was meaningfully involved in the decisions that have to do with climate change, resilience, or environmental justice? Anyone's feel free to jump in. <laughs> I, can I can go. Oh, go ahead, Taylor. <laughs> no, no, you, you go ahead. Okay. Um, I think for for us, it looks like um, when we're thinking about like policies and different programs and 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 initiatives that are implemented. Oftentimes, the and the the thought process is after we do something, then we'll think about the people who are affected and impacted. Um, and the way that things should be done is, uh, folks in the community who are going to be impacted should be involved from the beginning on any type of environmental change. Um, and doing that retroactively puts that he their health at risk. Um, it gambles their health on uh, economic development or for the betterment of, of other folks. Um, so I think for us, that means being involved at the beginning of a project or a change rather than at the end, um, and then not being uh, a byproduct or innocent bystander to um, like resource, resource distribution or any type of like development or economic change or anything like that. Um, especially what we've seen a lot of uh, when it when we think about um, gentrification and we think about all of these other environmental changes, uh, a lot of times the needs of other groups are put ahead of um, of folks who uh, you know have forget for have traditionally been not thought of. So for us, meaningful involvement would mean actually and you know intentionally being involved in the work rather than we did this thing and afterwards we have to scramble to uh, figure out ways to keep other folks who aren't directly benef you know, um, benefiting from, from whatever development or change, how do we keep them from sort of uprising or um, you know, how do we keep them sated, so to say. And just to add on, I would love to add on to what Taylor just said. I think I'm also a strong believer that if we're not including the communities that are being directly impacted by the climate crisis, and we're truly not going to be solving the climate crisis, who better to bring forth these innovative solutions and ideas than those who are being affected and are, are at the forefront and at the front lines of the climate crisis. But I'm also a strong believer in, um, you know, Taylor's presentation and, you know, how environmental justice is not just about having equity or equality, right? It's having justice for all people who are being affected by this crisis. One way or another, it's not just gonna be impacting one community. Yes, for now, you know, it's impacting the most marginalized communities uh, around this nation and around the world. But in the long run, you know, in about, uh, you know, uh, you know, in about nine to 10 years, we're gonna be seeing a lot more devastating impacts to other communities. And so it's never, you're not gonna be able to escape this, but I'm also, 
in, um, you know, I'm also a strong believer in meaningful impact in the sense of, you know, as an individual, we have a responsibility to, you know, really look at what's happening, the inequalities and injustices that are happening to our communities, even if you're not affected by those inequalities and injustices, looking at the communities that are, are your community members that are being affected and saying, what are you doing to make an impact within that community? What are you doing to make an impact within your own community? Whether that be taking systematic, ac systematic action uh, and that could look like protests, marches and rallies and really, you know, going against uh, the, you know, these industries and corporations and these government officials who are not listening to the communities that are being directly impacted by the climate crisis, or um, because because a lot of people can do systematic action or going into individual action and really uh, self-analyzing. And there's so many uh, individual actions to take, planting a tree, you know, changing your daily eating habits or something like that, you know, um, and there's just so many individual actions that you can take that can make a small difference. I'm also a firm believer that you can make a difference if we were to do one action, right? One, stepping up your action besides just going out to the marches and stuff like that. Um, but yeah. Yeah, so I, I completely agree with what both of you just said. Um, one of the things that you just said, Kevin, um, I was kind of thinking of before, and that is if you're in, if you're in this movement, if you're fighting for this problem, then you, you really can't, um, you can't take a, a half stance approach to it. Um, if you really want to make a difference, you have to completely throw yourself into this problem and you can't choose to um, believe in it sometimes, or you can't choose to um, only fight for it um, on one certain issue. It has to encompass the, the very broad range of what the climate justice and the climate change issue is. Um, in terms of um, like involvement in communities, I, I think one of, the, one of the biggest things that we need to work on as a society is including um, the climate issue into our education system. Um, so I think Taylor mentioned it before in her presentation and she's completely right. Um, from what I know and from what I have experienced, there is no mention of climate change or there is a very brief mention of climate change in our science classes. And we really need to um, teach our, our kids and the younger generation um, about climate change from a very young age because they are the ones who um, with us and after us are going to, um, uh, they're going to inherit this movement. Um, and they're also going to be dealing with a lot more consequences than we are right now. Um, so yeah, definitely education in schools. Um, another thing is um, just to talk about involvement and to get people involved, you don't have to mention, um, or you should mention, but you don't have to mention like explicitly climate change to people. Or if you're, you're trying to convince someone um, of climate change, you don't have to, um, you, you should, but you don't have to mention climate change in particular. Um, but what you can do is, is really like get down to the nitty gritty details and try to lure people in to the climate change and the climate justice movement by telling them and explaining to them about issues that directly impact them. Um, even if they, they don't believe in climate change itself, which they should, um, but, but really, find find details that impact their lives that are so related to the climate change movement, um, like um, them having low income or um, them being affected um, racially by the climate justice issue. Um, so really find small issues that you can convince them to um, get more involved in the, the climate justice movement. All right, thank you all for your answers. Um, and we actually just have time for like one more like quick wrap up question. I wish we had time for more. Um, but so just the last question I'd like to pose to all of you um, to close tonight is just know that there's a lot of students listening tonight that may be learning about climate justice, maybe 
you know, fairly recently, a lot of folks, I think, have started learning about the impacts of systemic racism this year in a way that maybe they hadn't before, just due to a lot of, of national events. And if um, for students out there who want to be advocates for climate justice, what advice do you have for them, um, especially if they may be new to this space, um, but are really passionate about being an, active, an activist, an advocate, um, and making a difference? What advice would you give them? Um, I can speak to that one, especially because I'm, I'm kind of closer um, to the youth. Um, I'd say because I, I am a youth um, leader myself. Um, but what I would say is um, just, just learn all you can about this issue. And that goes for, for anything you're interested in. Just learn as much as possible about the issue. Um, and then you can be educated um, when you're talking to people about the climate change issue or um, when you're having a discussion against with someone who um, is maybe um, giving you an opposing point or um, like arguing with you about uh, climate change. So um, yeah, I think just, just learn as much as possible. I'll go next. Um, one of the advices I would give, you know, having done this for nine years, I think activism for me is not a choice, is not a hobby, nor is it a, um, you know, a passion of mine. It's really literally for many communities, uh, it's a survival tool. Everyone, you know, there is no obligation to really say that we can do this as a passion or a hobby and as something that we can do on the site. It's literally something that we have to do because our community is already being affected. So I think one of the things I would say to young people who are watching this and are you know, going to be advocates for the environment or already are act, uh, activists and advocates for the environment and many other issues, I would say, uh, don't let any obstacles or adversities get in your way. Uh, I'm a firm believer that, you know, uh, even though that we, everyone goes to obstacles and adversities, never let uh, what you want to do or what you love to do uh, be affected by, you know, those uh, obstacles and adversities. But I will also say that, you know, young people today are not the leaders of tomorrow. We're the leaders of today. We're the young change makers today, of today. We're the advocates of today. We are the world leaders of today. Um, and we are truly making change. It's just about taking that first step. So I, I plead and I say that, you know, just take that first step. Look what you can do within your local community because there's definitely many, many things that you can do within your local community or get involved with an organization that's already working internationally, nationally, locally um, to really benefit your community or the nation or even globally uh, in communities all around the world. And um, I think I would end it with that. It's just, you can take that first step to make a difference. I definitely agree with uh, everything that's been said here. Um, I think some tips, I think for me, a good starting place has always been uh, local, local historical context, uh, that the local context of wherever you are can give you a lot of clues around what environmental justice issues exist. Uh, two books I'm gonna recommend. One is uh, A Terrible Thing to Waste. It's on the history of environmental racism. It's a, a very solid book if you're just starting out. And then uh, if you get a little deeper into it, uh, this book, Clean and White, it's a history of environmental racism is also very good. Um, yeah, I mean, I really agree uh, with, with things that were said here. And if it seems like it's too much to bite, like it just all seems overwhelming, there are a lot of really great environmental justice groups who are, um, looking for folks to volunteer their time. It's the best thing that you can offer is, is time, right? Time and energy to work on something when, when there are a lot of groups that um, maybe don't have funding to keep and retain people full-time as staff or part-time, um, really having folks volunteer. And uh, I think, you know, Kevin put it best in a lot of times, like there may be a lot of things that keep you from wanting to jump into the work, but, um, you know, a big part of it of learning about how to do it is just just hopping in uh, and and being open to the process of helping and learning. 
uh, along the way. Um, and just, you know, on the other part too, understanding that folks have been doing this for a really long time. Um, and so, you know, don't expect yourself to sort of be an expert when you first start, but uh, being open to whatever comes and being dedicated to the causes uh, will yield a lot for you and the movement. Excellent. Thank you all so much. I think it's great to end what was like a pretty sweeping view of um, different climate justice issues with some real tangible advice and action steps that people can take from this. So thank you so much for providing those. And thanks just for all of your time and your passion and your expertise and for showing up um, to all of um, everyone who's listening and then to Sydney and Taylor and Kevin. We really appreciate it. Um, so everyone have a good night. Uh, be well, and uh, we will be in touch. Thank you so much, everybody.